Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show. And as you know, I've been mentioning that we want to bring you interesting and new guests with new topics. But today we go a little bit away from that because we have Nikhil Agarwal with us. And I wanted to bring him on because we recently started a relationship with him, getting to know him a little bit and his organization. And in the past, when people came to us for our residential real estate investing advice and mentoring, they basically all knew that they're going to get all the relationships that I have built with my team over the years as part of the package if you want to. And Nikhil is in a sense a little different because he is representing a relatively new turnkey provider that is operating right now in Michigan and wants to expand and do turnkey investing and providing turnkey services for people who actually make good money but don't want to spend a whole lot of time researching the properties and finding property management and all that stuff, which is exactly what we are saying in our out of state turnkey residential real estate investing strategy that we have been providing to our clients for the last few years. So here is basically a new relationship that we want to expand and you are along for the ride to get to know how are they actually working, what do they do, what might they do a little bit differently and then listen in on how interesting this could be and obviously at the end we will actually show you and allow you a way to do it directly or through us but I thought it was an interesting little twist not to wait until we already have the relationship established but give you an opportunity to kind of be at the very early stages when we form these new relationships. So I hope you enjoy, I hope you download the episode, I hope you give it a five-star review and you will help us with that to make more episodes like that. So enjoy and stay to the end. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show. Today we want to have a little bit more conversation about different ways on how we can actually invest in real estate. And our guest today for that conversation and something a little bit different is Nikhil Agarwal. Welcome to the show, Nikhil. Thank you, Axel. Real pleasure to be here and a real honor to be here as well. Yeah, absolutely. We love having you. And as always, I did a little bit of a research on, you know, what your platform is and your website, and we're going to get into all of that. But what I've started like in this year, I should have done it before, but this year I want to pay more attention to it is to ask our guests like you, Nikhil, give us a little bit of the origin story. How did you get into what you're doing right now? And kind of what's a little bit the you know, Nikia came to this earth and, you know, wanted to be a real estate expert or what happened in between? Absolutely. So I come from Hyderabad, India, and I grew up there in a family that's very entrepreneurial, a lot of real estate, etc. I surprised all of them by saying, I want to go be an engineer. So I came to the States, did my aerospace engineering, went to work at Boeing for six years, you know, nothing to do with real estate. From there, I transitioned to business school. And during business school, I started a business to help myself get cheaper student loans, myself and my classmates. Right. This business has grown beautifully over the last four years. Now, if you go to grad school, there's about 15% chance you'll take a loan through our company. But what this also gave us access to is these same students, they graduate, they become high earners, and four or five years down the road, they want to invest in real estate. Right. And they don't know how to. And that's really where the origin of this business is. Is This is a new vertical in our student loan business to help the same audience X number of years later, once they've started to accumulate some wealth, start investing in real estate because you know they are busy. They don't have time to figure out how to invest in real estate. And we can do it for them. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. And I would assume, even though you probably have access to the alumni list of your own business school, then you're basically also looking for anybody on referring you to other people that also did the same pathway, kind of, right? Very much so. We, you know, we're excited to work with folks who are looking to deploy a few hundred thousand or more into real estate portfolios. Oftentimes, these investors have previously been working with syndications and we are bringing a new model to them where we are saying, hey, instead of investing in a syndication, why don't you directly own the portfolio? We'll make it just as easy 
as a financial transaction for you because these investors they love to write a check right yeah yeah and we will talk about that because what we do in idea wealth grower and anybody who is regularly listening to our show knows that there are certain points in time i actually identify two points in time the one is when somebody is either ahead of their first purchase or in between purchases i call that the accumulation phase right so we let's say we just bought the second property and now we have to basically accumulate money for down payment for the next one so where would you put it i call it into what we call our accumulation phase cash flow parking and the other thing is literally not for accumulation even though that obviously happens but for cash flow parking in the literal sense to say okay so now i have my two properties i'm accumulating money because i for example am a good person and put 10% of everything that comes in first you know pay yourself first you know richest man of babylon those kind of things so that goes into the accumulation but then also obviously the properties we invest in we only do that when they are cash flow positive from day one so that cash flow is typically not consumed by the people that work with us so that is another good thing to put in so you have accumulation money plus the cash flow out of the properties in between purchases so in that sense there i think there are similarities now one thing i want to touch on really quick kind of like in a sense as a public service because i don't recall that we have anybody who really came over from india but i have read a lot of articles lately and maybe we can do a little public service in that sense that people that come from your home country have been heavily recruited in the last 10 plus years to work in the tech industry i mean you could say boeing is also kind of a tech industry i even once did a contract work for boeing for about a year and a half so i would call them a tech industry for sure but now that we have heard a lot about the layoffs one of the issues is if people come over here and they get either a student visa first to go to school like it sounds like you may have done and then you get out of school and you have about a year in most cases to find a job where the company then sponsors you let's say that would be boeing but then if a company like boeing starts laying off people or meta or google or you name it all these tech companies then you only have if i'm not mistaken 60 days to find another sponsor or you have to go back to your home country so obviously you left boeing you went to business school and stuff how was it for you and what can you recommend for people that maybe realize now because it's been in the news so much what should i do before that happens to me and then i only have 60 days to scramble absolutely i was fortunate that i'm i've not been in that position i'm a us citizen i was able to skip all of the hassles that come with that however you know i have a ton of friends in fact my sister in law she just got laid off you know she's in that 60 day period trying to find her next opportunity and it's incredibly incredibly stressful because it's just such a tight timeline and if you think about it you know she's been here for 4 years after graduation she's really you know the only work environment she's known is the american work environment Yeah. And in 60 days her entire life could be uprooted and she'd have to go back to India and finish. Absolutely. I mean I thought your first answer would be well you know for your sister and otherwise find yourself an American guy or girl. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's that way you know so uh, that, but I think that is you know I mean that is obviously the thing that you can start before you get laid off. <laughs> so but are there actually I mean since I'm really not that tightly connected to that community are there any things that people could do while they're still employed to avoid this from happening uh, start interviewing you know it's usually not too much of a surprise when those layoffs come mm. so i would say you know it's always good to keep reaching out to recruiters and interviewing with them and be prepared to you know find your next opportunity very quickly the other thing i'll add is you know this is not for all the companies but a lot of the bigger ones they understand and for example even though my sister in law was laid off she is currently on payroll she got laid off in january she's on payroll till march and then from march the clock starts for 60 days right right so a lot of these companies are doing these things to make it a little bit easier for the transition you know when you say 60 days it sounds like a very tight time frame but suddenly 120 days don't sound too bad to switch jobs uh, yeah i would agree although i mean right now we are still in a very strong labor market but you know if some of the dooms uh they predictions are right that could actually change 
One thing that I have, because I mean, I came to the United States uh, from Germany originally, and what I really found is whether it's for a green card or for citizenship, it's basically never really too late to get started into really researching what kind of circumstance. I mean, yes, we were jokingly saying you can marry a citizen and, you know, but if that's not really the path and it shouldn't necessarily be the only path, then what are things that can be done to, for example, get to that citizenship or green card situation. And one thing I wanted to contribute, even though I by no means an expert and don't take this as investing or legal advice, but there are other types and oftentimes people forget that there are other types of ways, for example, to receive a green card. One of which is in founding a business and creating employment, right? So while you might be a graduate, fellow graduate of Nikhil, and you might be in a nice job that pays a nice salary, even to the point, like you said, three, four, five years into that job where you actually start thinking about investing. And real estate is one opportunity, at least for, again, accumulation, but there are other areas to invest as well or save. You know, we touched before we started recording about the T-bills that have now actually really gotten pretty nice interest rates, why they are really liquid, you don't have to hold them very long compared to real estate. But that thought, I believe, is an important aspect for your fellow people from India and other places that may be listening to us today because you're here, to consider, okay, how can I maybe look at other options, other visa that might be available to me so I'm not in the single lane, you know, and I have to kind of stuck for however long until I marry somebody in that lane, but I can, I don't know exactly what the number is, and it's a pretty substantial amount of money, but if you start planning for it from the get-go and maybe make investments that help you accelerate the accumulation of funds that can ultimately lead to, for example, building a business like you did, ultimately you build a business, you employ people, obviously it wouldn't even though you're a citizen now, but if you were to say, where am I standing now? Could I, if I still were in this original state, apply for a green card based on investment and that's just one of many right that are available so i think my advice would be in addition to what you said always be on the lookout for other job opportunities so you don't actually wait until you get laid off but at the same time do something with your money with us with your organization nikhil so that you accumulate to a point where you can say if i really have to i can build a business hire five or six people and then get my green card that way and don't really ever have to bother about it anymore. As far as I know, there are some things where you don't have to do this on an individual basis. You can have like two friends and the three of you invest a certain amount of money and build the business and stuff like that. So that works too. I'm not, uh, like I said, I'm not the expert, but I think it's important in this day and age. And I want our podcast to be somewhat current, especially when we have somebody with your background on it. That, you know, we touch on that a little bit. Now, coming to the real estate investing that you mentioned, you said, okay, instead of buying syndications, and we had plenty of guests who explained how a syndication works, can you tell us a little bit in more detail how people invest if they work with your organization? What do they get? How much money is the minimum? Do they need to be accredited? Those kind of things. Absolutely. So one of the advantages, they don't have to be accredited, but Oftentimes our investors are accredited just because the minimum when it starts to make sense to do this tends to be at least 50K, if not 100K in terms of investment. The reason is you're not owning a portion of something. When you work with us, you're directly owning the real estate. We try to make it as close to a financial transaction for you as possible, right? So investing in a syndication is you read a few documents, you do your due diligence, you sign a check right we want to make that the experience but the end result is a little bit different and here's how it's different because you directly own the real estate you actually have liquidity right we say real estate is not liquid but any residential property in large populated area 60 days maybe 90 days you can make it liquid right but if you're in a syndication you're at the mercy of the gp deciding when they want to exit right well, not only that, uh, you're signing literally a contract, whether you're accredited or not, there are different versions of syndications, but you're literally signing a contract that says this investment is planned to be a minimum three years or four years or five years. 
and then the exit will be planned and basically you know the community of investors and so forth so it's not you invest now and if in two months you need the money you can kind of get it back right that's not how syndication works yep the second thing is the flip side of that you know a lot of our investors they don't really need the money they don't you know for them it's about generational wealth they want to pass this down to their yes their children or someone else right. right if you invest in a syndicate you exit in year 7 you get the money back and now what do i do i have to find another syndication in a quick timeline to put the money back in otherwise i get a big, big tax hit mm-hmm. right they like the stress free nature of okay i've bought my property it's mine it's going to be mine hopefully forever right hopefully i don't need that cash hopefully i don't need that liquidity it's forever right okay. And the third piece is a little bit nuanced. You know, we talk a lot about cost sex studies. I think one of your podcasts spoke about cost sex studies, right? And it's great, right? It gives you these tax advantages, tax deferrals. But one of the nuances, if I understand it correctly, and definitely I'm not an expert in the accounting part, is it only makes sense if you have passive income to offset, right? Because regular depreciation takes care of sort of offsetting the cash flow that most properties generate the cost sex studies is really meant to offset let's say you have some other income from a different investment that's not tax advantaged the cost sex study can you know help you report a paper loss that then offsets that income and reduces the taxes you pay on that income what if you don't have that kind of income to offset if you're a w2 employee you often don't have passive income that can be offset from a cost sex study and you end up in the situation where you know you've paid x thousand dollars for a cost sex study which is of no use to you you just carry that loss forward on your tax return every year hoping someday you'll get some passive income that you can offset with it yeah absolutely and I, for our audience i want to just very really quick describe what the differences are you have basically in everybody who buys real estate literally owning it in their name on title or in the name of their llc they have the option to say okay i can just say okay i bought a piece of real estate and let me be a little cute and say okay i bought it and it cost me $275,000 right so then the government says okay you can write it off in 27 and a half years so $10,000 a year i mean it's just price was perfect from that calculation <laughs> right so that's one thing and what you do is your CPA who files your taxes for you just takes those $10,000 every year and makes it a write-off to your taxes. And so whatever, let's say your tax rate is 30%, you would get about $3,300 or so, $3,000 off these $10,000 reduction in your tax. And obviously, I mean, I always make the assumption if somebody can either directly purchase a property or purchase into your properties, because they have 100,000 or 50,000 or 150,000 to invest then they also have an income that has a you know a reasonably significant tax burden right if you make 200,000 or 180,000 and you waited for a few years and now you put 60 80 100,000 in an investment you still have that job and you still pay that tax right so that's the one option to say okay i bought this property $10,000 for the next 27 and a half years the other option is obviously to say, well, I bought this property, but everything has different values and has different lifetimes. So the windows may be good for 20 years. The water heater is good for eight years. The floors are good for 30 years. And you can do the study, like you mentioned, that goes in and says, OK, let's take this thing basically apart as if we were to build it from scratch and look at every component and how long the lifespan is. And then year after year, you basically write off the things that fall within that lifespan which in most cases obviously means in the beginning you have higher amounts of money to sign or write off so instead of ten thousand dollars in the first few years it might be twenty or thirty thousand dollars but then as you're exhausting more and more of that value it doesn't really change the overall value in the latter years it will be less so those are basically the two options i agree with you as long as we talk in residential real estate even in a fourplex or stuff i think it is way too costly to do that rather than just going with a government approved thing especially because i always feel and i would love to ask what you think about it when we have whether it's in a podcast or when i talk to new clients or when we do mentoring sessions i always try to make very sure 
that we look at the arch of investment or the journey of investment. And that's why we came up with this idea of the time freedom point where we say, okay, how much passive income at some point in the future do you actually want to make? Then we can calculate backwards to say that means this is the number of investments you need to make, assuming a certain return on that investment. So it's oftentimes eight properties, nine properties, 12 properties, whatever number might apply, at least at that point of calculation. It takes away this notion, okay, I go to Nikhil, I basically give him $100,000, he does the investment for me and takes care of most everything else, and I'm never going to see the guy again. Well, that's really not the case, right? We want to have a long-term relationship. So when you look at the journey for people that work with you, can you describe a little bit how that looks over, let's say, a five-year, a six-year, or ten-year time horizon? Absolutely. We take over the property management for these properties. So they're with us, you know, for a very, very long time. Of course, we are in our infancy over here starting, but the plan is for them to be with us for decades. But, you know, typically they come to us, they say, hey, this is, we call it a buy box, right? So they're defining the constraints around which they'd be happy to own a property. Mm -hmm. An example of this would be, hey, I want to make sure it's in these kind of areas, right? I want to, like Detroit Ring Cities is a very popular area where we are focused right now, or Ohio, some of these markets where there's a lot of cash flow. I want to make at least, you know, 8% of whatever I put in should come back to me as cash flow every year, right? And they'll have a few different, the property needs to be at least 100,000, less than 150,000, you know, some parameters. Okay. So the defined buy box, that's the upfront. And of course, we are signing off on the buy box to say, hey, this is something reasonable, right? right? If they say 35% cash on cash, we're going to say, well, we can't help you. We don't know where to buy these properties you speak of. Right. Then the next step is execution. So during execution, what happens is my team is finding the properties that would meet that investor's criteria, getting a sign off from the investor saying, hey, we're going after this property. This is what we're going to offer, etc. This looks like quick emails, right? This is right, right. email. They'll get a response back. Yes, approved. And we go pursue that property to get it under contract for that investor. Yeah. Now, once we have it under contract, we'll go through inspection, negotiations, all of that stuff to get it closed. We'll help the investor with getting a mortgage if they want a mortgage on the property. And once it's closed, we'll take care of any renovations that need to happen, as well as the property management, finding a tenant, placing the tenant finances. We help, you know, if they would like help with the accounting, we connect them with an accountant. And then we make sure, you know, on a monthly cadence, they receive their financial reports and a check, right? So that's kind of how we operate, right? It's a very turnkey solution where we are trying to make it so that they own real estate, but as passively as possible. Okay. Yeah. And I was literally, I was itching to ask you next because it sounds very much like turnkey investing, which is what we are doing as well with our, we call our members, the tribal members or the members of the tribe. And I think you basically described almost an ideal turnkey provider. The one thing I didn't hear you say, but I want to kind of hop back into that is what typical turnkey providers that don't do BTR investments do is they find properties that are, I always, and you may have heard me say this and our audience knows, I always say this, the ugly duckling in a good neighborhood, then have a team that they build over time And that's why they're not in 20 different markets typically, but in one major market or major area. And then they have a team that has all the different crafts that you need to renovate a property. And they send their team. And the main reason to send their team, that's why I always say this is so important when working with somebody that whether they call themselves turnkey provider or they call themselves something else, but operate like a turnkey provider is that they don't have to contract for all the different things. Because if you do that, not only do you pay the profit margin that the contractors obviously want to make and should make, but also you're paying completely through the nose labor rates, right? I always use the comparison. If you are a trained plumber, right, and you go and fix something and you know, okay, there is some leak and I need to put a new pipe and a new fitting in there, that thing, you go to Lowe's, to Home Depot or whatever, plumbing supply and it costs maybe eight dollars ten dollars fifteen dollars maybe so then the real difference is why do we as investors get two hundred dollar bills every time there's a leak 
Well, for one, they charge you 80, 90, 100 dollars to just go to the property. They look at it. The good ones have the stuff in their truck, pull it out, put it in, charge you the 15, 20 dollars or whatever the pieces cost that they needed to do the repair. And then they say it took 0.75 hours and that is 80 dollars. So you have 80 dollars plus 90 dollars plus 15 dollars and a little bit tip and you're at 200 dollars versus a team internally where the plumber, the mason, the electrician, all these people are employees, right? I want to make this clear for our audience members. If you have a team, a renovation team where everybody is an employee, so they don't have to chase after new contracts and new clients all the time, they get a salary every month. So that's the benefit for them. But for the turnkey provider, you have a crew and you can basically schedule your crew to go property to property well, now you don't pay $80 plus $90 to show up every day. You just pay the $15 plus whatever the salary, like maybe let's say $25, $30 an hour, or even fully burdened, it might be $60 an hour, but it's never going to be what you get charged as a customer when you have a leak in your house. So that aspect, I think, is very important. So are you actually building a crew for your like uh, Michigan area to do the renovations as well? Absolutely. We've taken a slightly different approach where we've started to build relationships with the contractors, right? So we're coming down on pricing with the contractors, but they're still third parties. They are not W2 employees with us. Okay. We've taken the property management side as, you know, sort of W2 employees, okay. our team. For the contractors, we are not yet at the scale where we are able to essentially employ different trades full-time on our payroll. Yeah, one thing that I've seen, by the way, for up and coming turnkey providers, so to speak, maybe you can take that as a consideration is some of them when they first started, and I've been working with one in Ohio, when they were less than 100 units, and they are now well above, I bet they're probably approaching a 1000 now, right? So wow. it's been quite a journey, and a lot of growth, which isn't that surprising, because in the last three or four years, the industry has grown a lot. But what they did initially, when they didn't have that many units yet is, they formed the relationships both to the contractors, which you said you already do. But the other thing I thought was smart is they basically bought, quote unquote, a contingency of time from handyman. Mm. Right. So they basically said, OK, we don't want to have you on payroll and we don't really have enough work necessarily for full time work. And most handymen don't want to do that anyway. But we want to have 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week. And the good thing is these handymen typically have a relatively affordable fee, like $40, hour, $40 $50 an hour plus material, but they're kind of like jack of all trades, right? So you can send them out and you can tell your investor, which I appreciated as an investor when they said, well, if we have something and it's not totally clear what needs to be done, we send our handyman. In many cases, he can fix it. So then you really only pay his rate plus what it takes to fix. If he finds it can't be fixed and needs an expert, then all you pay is for him to go there for half an hour, it costs you 30 bucks. They actually ultimately realized it should be 50 bucks flat rate every time, you know? So, but still I'd much rather pay $50 for somebody to go with a high likelihood of being able to fix the issue than having to pay $200 every time. And I want people to understand, I would again invite you to give a little comment. This aspect of repairs, even though we're putting money in the reserve for our investments, I always see this basically to some extent as a cash flow killer because, you know, $200, $300 is oftentimes what you get on a $100,000, $150,000 investment as positive cash flow and maybe even less with these high interest rates. So with that in mind, if you have a $200 repair, even if it isn't anything significant, that month you make zero cash flow, right? Now, you might say long term, that doesn't really matter that much, but the whole purpose is, and I know and saw that on your website, Nikhil, you want to make cash flow, right? So what's your take? What do you tell your clients when it comes to how do we preserve the cash flow? How do we make it so that we don't constantly pay for keeping the property afloat and never really make any positive cash flow? There's two things. One is exactly what you said, right? We have to be cost conscious in our decisions. And we do it in two ways, right? One is, yes, we want to keep costs down in sort of execution, but we don't want to be too frugal either. What we try to think about is, okay, what's the optimal decision from an investor's perspective, right? Like you know, the classic example is appliances, right? Do we want to spend the money to repair a very old appliance or do we want to spend the money to just 
you know, buy a new appliance, even though it's going to cost $200 more, we know now it's under warranty. It's going to last for, you know, 10 years and we don't have to worry about it as opposed to something that's going to keep breaking down. Absolutely. And by the way, I mean, anybody who's heard my podcast, I have this pet peeve about extended warranties, right? If, <laughs> if I were your customer, Nikhil, I would say, okay, Axel told me, buy that new appliance and don't just go with a manufacturer's warranty, get the extended one from Best Buy, Lowe's, Home Depot that covers for five, six, seven years or whatever the thing is. But for appliances, that's typically what it is. Because then I know, okay, I not only spend the $200 extra plus maybe $35 for the extended warranty, but now for the next five years, whatever happens with that thing, it doesn't bother me. You know, It doesn't bother you. Yep. And the other thing is when you first get into the property, right? Take care of the small stuff, right? You don't want, you know, there's like these rental inspections that happen with the city, right? Every time there's, you know, to your call, you know, even though they, in your model, when you have W2 employees as, con, you know, who are doing the work, it doesn't pinch you as much for every phone call that happens. Right. But I'm sure it still does, right? Every time you have to make a visit to a property, it's an additional burden. Right. But instead, if you do things right up front, you have a diligent inspection up front to make sure you're fixing all the little things. It ensures that, you know, for the next X years, you are in a very good space. Hopefully, you don't have to visit that property much, if at all. I totally agree with that. Now, with that in mind, what you just described, how much do you feel of the results of the inspection report should be pushed onto the seller? We, well, it depends on how you enter the negotiation, right? But generally speaking, we've always reviewed the inspection report. And if there were any surprises, certainly anything above, call it $250, right? We usually go back to the seller and ask for a concession, right? If there's no surprises, if it was just, you know, we knew this property is in this condition and, you know, it's the same stuff comes up on the inspection report, then we then generally don't go back to the seller for any concessions, right? But a simple example was we got a property under contract. We went and did the property inspection. They had the water turned off. Right. So we couldn't properly inspect. We asked for a pretty massive discount. We said, hey, we want five thousand dollars off or you pay for the reinspection. And, you know, we're happy to go reinspect it if everything looks good. Guess what? The city had turned off the water, but they turned it back on. We did the inspection. I, I wish I could show you a video right now, but, you know, it was just raining. It was literally raining underneath the property yeah. in the crawl space. We sent that video and they knocked, we knocked off ten grand from the property price. It turned out, it was funny because the video was a little bit more dramatic than it. the real problem. There was a bathroom just above it, it was leaking, you know, not such a dramatic situation, but we were fortunate in that situation, you know, the seller was willing to knock off 10 grand. We got a great deal, costed, I think, probably a thousand bucks to fix. So yeah, we do go back for concessions anytime there's a surprise. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. And that's actually what I think an investor should expect because, I mean, they basically work with you so you can act on their behalf, right? Even if the sale is not completed and the closing hasn't happened, but it's a long-term relationship. I always say, why do I look for turnkey providers that operate pretty much like you do is do the renovations or have a means of fixing it for reasonable cost, then offer the property at a price that actually appraises so that I can get financing and not just a fraction of the price that I pay. And then also do the management. And I believe there is a psychological component here. If I had renovated or fixed the property for sale, then I fix it in a way that I don't have to basically live through the pain of constantly getting calls from the tenant after they move in because I didn't fix it properly or had didn't have it fixed properly. Now, that kind of begs the question there is nowadays Obviously, with these high interest rate, mortgage interest rates, the notion, and I'm actually right up front, I'm saying I'm a proponent, but I'm really curious because as a turnkey provider, I'm sure you're actually going through, you know, should we, shouldn't we, or how do we do it? This kind of advanced pros and cons, basically, for built to rent properties versus existing stock properties. What's your take on that? And have you settled on any kind of pass forward? Yeah, to be honest, in the markets where we are operating right now, built to rent hasn't taken off in the way, you know, we are seeing in some other states. I guess the cost basis for the properties 
you know, existing properties uh, that you can renovate into a fantastic condition is just significantly lower, right? It's not unusual for us to pick up a property at 65 or 75K, three bedroom, one, one and a half bath, thousand square feet, you know, an ICR, et cetera. And we are able to rent them out at 1400, 1450. There's high property taxes in the area. That's probably what eats us the most. So those numbers generally, you know, we can get to a 10% plus cash on cash you know, we like to say 8% to investors, right, to set the right expectations. But more recently, we've been successful at delivering 10% plus cash on cash. So given that we haven't looked at bill to rent, would your recommend be to recommendation be even, you know, in these lower priced areas to start looking at that or? The thing about it is why, uh, why it is currently my recommendation has to do with a few things. I totally agree with you that you can find in most markets where the performance criteria, you know, how close can you get to like 1% or so ratio between rent and purchase price after the renovation, where those criteria can be met. And there are a lot of like along the coast, big cities and stuff where you really have a hard time doing that. But in those areas where you can meet that, when I'm looking at it and saying, OK, well, I let's say we were to work together, you find a property 60, 70, 75,000, then you put in $50,000 of renovation and then you sell it for, let's say, 145 and rent it for 1400 or 1500. That all makes sense. But one thing that I found is the amount of potential issues that come up with an older property that is being renovated, even if the quality of renovation is good is more of an, a little bit of a continuous grind. Hmm. And in some cases, when you say, OK, what can I get for the same or slightly more money? Now, not necessarily in the same market, I admit that. But if I say, for example, I have properties $150,000 in like Cincinnati, but I can buy, buy a built to rent property in Memphis, which is also known to be a very uh, typical rental market. And the new property costs 163 and the renovated property costs 145, 150. They rent for about the same. So here comes basically my view on it. I have a brand new property. One of the differences that I can do as the owner right at closing is I can get a warranty on the new property that can go up to 10 years. So pretty much all the things, all the structural things, all the fundamental things, I can ask my builder, because obviously working with a builder in this case, to do the extended warranty on pretty much everything that isn't already covered under structural warranties. So I can get a property that is pretty much encapsulated in insurance policies that cost me a total of maybe a few thousand dollars extra, which is not that hard to get from an appraisal and financing perspective because it's a brand new property. So instead of 160, maybe I pay 165. Now I have the whole thing completely encapsulated for five to 10 years. That means there is no need to put any money aside for maintenance. We typically on renovated properties advise 5% for maintenance. There's also no need for another 5% to put aside for CapEx because it's brand new, right? You don't have to say, okay, well, this roof is eight years old, I leave it on there because it probably lives another eight years and then we have to renovate it or 10. Well, my roof is brand new, right? So no CapEx and no maintenance, that's 10% more cash flow, right? Just for that, you still have your vacancy reserve that you want to build. And obviously you have at least the option, and I'm not saying it is automatic, but you have the option to get slightly better tenants because you can vet them for qualifying to be the first ones to live in a brand new house literally brand new everything is new right so those are some of the things so no maintenance reserve no capex reserve potentially better tenants and the real thing my argument is it used to be that the renovated properties were 25 even sometimes 30 percent cheaper than the new ones but now we're at a point where i can get a renovated one for 140 150 and a new one for 165 to 200 that's really, and in, in especially since we, your clients and our clients only really put 20% down. So if the property, the new one, let's say cost 30,000 more, right? But we are only putting 5,000 of our own money in. So instead of putting, let's say 35,000 and $150,000 property, I put 40,000, 5,000 more of my money. But from day one, I have 10% more cash flow. 
right? So, and this is mainly relevant because cash flow has come down because it's eaten by the high interest rates. And we, you and I can't do anything about it. Right. As long as the interest rates are seven, seven and a half percent, they're just going to be there. And it's probably going to be a while until they come back into the force. So that difference is being that's basically cash flow that's being taken away by the government. If I can compensate that, at least to some extent, to say, well, then I'm not building that much of a reserve. I think there's an argument to be made. And that's basically my reasoning and why I asked you, you know, have you considered uh, new build properties versus renovated properties? Yeah, I think after this conversation, I am going to go consider build to rent properties. I think, you know, market specifics definitely matter. Yeah. I think the most surprising part to me here was the 165K for a new build, right? If that's, well, that's the same thousand square foot or 1100 square foot property. It's not a mansion, right? Obviously. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, standard attractive rent property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's sort of news to me per se. And if that's yeah, a way... Call me, I can give you some some hints. <laughs> Absolutely. <they're... laughs> we should chat a little bit more because I would love to learn a little bit more and see if uh, you know if there's ways for us to work together on that. I mean, the thing is, I think we are both in the business, you a little bit more directly than I am because I mentor people to get connections. And that's why we have the podcast. I want our audience and your friends who hopefully listen to say, okay, these guys discussed something that could be interesting for me. I can call Axel and see what different organization he works with, or I can go directly to Nikhil and work directly with him in Michigan on the properties he's on his website right now, right? So that's part of the reason, but I also have to say one thing, and that's always been my observation, and I'm curious what you would say about it, but I feel all the people, not only when they're guests on the podcast, but really the community of people in the real estate industry are just overall all really nice people. Oh my gosh, so amazing. So amazing. We, you know, there's this little network on Twitter, right, where people like to chat about their properties and what they're doing. And we've reached out to so many folks as we're getting started here. And it's been incredible to hear from them you know, about their experiences, how they've done various things, how they've learned and grown. No one is shy to share their stories and resources. And likewise, over here, you know, Axel, thank you for welcoming me to your podcast and being able to have these discussions. It's the real estate world is a very, very friendly world. 100% agree with that. Yeah. And I think part of it is that people in real estate, regardless which role they take, there is really no envy. I think all we want for any other people in real estate is for them to succeed. And yeah. if we can do a little contribution, you know, if you say, hey, you know, I think this is intriguing, but I have no access to anybody who does these BTRs. I literally mean it, even though we are on recording and say, call me and we work on it. Right. And that is my experience across the board. We build a network of connections and everybody's happy to help. OK, cool. So. Before we come to an end, as you know, I always ask two questions to every guest. The first one is, if you could meet anybody, past or present, who would it be and why? So Carl Icahn is the person I thought about. Okay. The reason is, so he's an activist investor. For those who are not familiar with him, you know, he basically will go buy shares of these public companies, get on the boards and force them to change, and often unlocks a lot of value that might be trapped in these companies. And his success is one part, but I think the part that's most curious to me is confidence in an environment where everyone is against him, right? If you're an activist investor, you're taking a position that literally every Wall Street analyst thinks that you're wrong, right? And in that situation, you're betting hundreds of millions of dollars to go and prove your position is right. And he's done it so many times. So for him, I'm very curious to meet him, learn how does he have this conviction and how does he execute against that conviction? I think it'd be very, it'd be a fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a fascinating choice. Uh, do you have any inkling or kind of suspicion how he does it or why it is? I was reading about his upbringing, right? And I think he was a little bit bullied in his upbringing. And I wonder if it's a little bit related to that, right? You probably have to develop a little bit of a thick skin yeah. um, when you go through that in your childhood. And I was curious, you know, hey, is there anything that, hold, you know, I don't know if anyone can ever tell, you know, oh, X happened to me. That's why I do Y. No, but absolutely. I mean, yeah. No, I, actually, my theory, if you were to ask me what is my theory and not specifically for him, and I'm not even necessarily sure that it has so much to do with the upbringing, 
I think if you say this is what I want to do, especially and if I'm not mistaken, he has often said he is doing it on behalf of his fellow shareholders. Yep. Then what I would say is, and there's a perfect example and people will say, oh, now he, there he goes again. <laughs> but for me, the perfect example, and you live in Michigan, so it's an even more perfect example, is the auto industry, right? When companies get to a certain size, the bigger they get and the older they get, the more complacent they get. And yep. I think that's what, you know, when people would say, well, what is he going to bring up again is obviously my fanboy of Tesla. It should not really be possible that after a hundred years of any and every organization that somebody founded to try to be a car company, somebody comes along and says, okay, I just changed the paradigm and everybody is sleeping on them until they're 20 years old and they're the number one organization in the world, not just in the United, in the world when it comes to electric cars. And that's, I think, a really stark example of complacency. Only when they were forced to, and somebody like I can, if he would have been friends with Elon Musk and see what they do and what they need to do and where it's going and why and how it can become reality. If you read Master Plan Part 1 and Part 2, and you I can, you would say, I'm going to buy shares in GM and Ford and Chrysler or Stellantis, and I shake this place up because these guys are super complacent. Absolutely. So that's basically, I think one way to do it is to say, where are organizations that show, literally show indications of complacency? Yeah. So, but I don't know. I mean, I would go with you and find out if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the other question, the second and absolutely last question is always, if you had a time machine, you're not allowed to change the time space continuum, but otherwise you can go forward, backward, pretty much anywhere. Where would you go and why? So I, I thought about this one. I didn't have a direct answer, but I thought about this one. I decided I want to go like 400 years in the future. Okay. There's two reasons. The first reason is I want to know the things that we can't even imagine today. Right. right? Well, there's probably something that we can't verbalize. We just you know don't have the capacity to think about. And I hope that's going to exist a few hundred years from today. So that's what I would love to go and see. And hopefully the human race is still around. But, you know, may maybe uh, Elon Musk makes sure that that happens. They're all, they're all going to be sitting on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is a fascinating thought because if we just do the opposite, right, and we're to say, okay, where was humanity in 1623? Hmm. Right? And could we imagine today? Yeah, and I would have interviewed you, like, you know, with my little sword in my in my <laughs> court and say, hey, Nick here, you know, what would you do? And you say, I go to 2023 and want to see what has happened in 400 years. It probably just completely mind blowing, right? Like, I mean, I would actually go not quite that far. I would want to go maybe to, what is it, 2100? You know, I'm always assuming we get multiple trips, right? But I would go to 2100. <laughs> because of you, I would really want to see what becomes of India. Yeah, India is a very interesting place right now. The Actually, this time when I went back, there were many, so every December I go to India. So when I say this time, it means, you know, my yearly yeah, trip. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of family members were like, hey, you need to think about coming back to India because this is the place, like everything is happening here now. Manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing is moving to India because, you know, folks are skeptical of China. Africa is not fully ready yet. So they view India as like this stable middle ground where they'd like to set up manufacturing. You know, the tech industry has been booming for a while now. My hometown is, you know, one of the towns where the sort of tech industry has really taken off and changed the face. Real estate has been little known fact, but I looked up this sort of statistic in 2019, I think. My hometown was actually the highest appreciation in the world for on a 10 year time frame for commercial real estate, not for residential, for commercial real estate. Right, right. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I mean, one thing that I always find fascinating is how math, mathematics can sometimes skew the picture a little bit, right? Like if you have a piece of land that costs a thousand dollars an acre and you build a factory or a large business building on it and the cost of building it costs you, let's say four or 500,000, and industry is completely exploding. It's a different kind of math than when you try to do the same thing in somewhere in California, right, where the acre costs 
200,000 or 500,000 and the building to build cost 100 million, or if you want a 10x or 50x that, it's <laughs> almost impossible, right? So math is like that. But on the other hand, I think it's a very good indication that there is tremendous growth. That's also why I said I want to see because I'm a little concerned that there are some things that are very traditional and some things that are very forward looking. And I don't want to sound like a pessimist, but I think there is plenty of opportunity for conflict. And I don't mean conflict externally, but internal conflict. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to claim to know much about it. But I, for example, think the still existing caste system is a huge issue. Right. And it seems like nobody, at least from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem like anybody really wants to address it. But a coherent recognition of the value of human beings across the board is, I believe, an absolute catalyst to long term success. And it will be interesting to see in the next 50, 60, 80 years how India is going to address that. Absolutely. I think, you know, it comes down to education to me, right? I think as literacy rates and sort of education levels increase in the population. The, because what we do see is the urban areas, right, especially amongst the more educated folks, these barriers fall away, right? However, you go to different parts of India and suddenly it's very evident that these systems still exist and divide people and uh, they create right. friction. Yeah, uh, but it's, it, I think what you're pointing to, and I, I love that you mentioned it in that way, is from the bottom up or from the ground up evolution. My concern is a little more which of those existing traditional things serve certain views and certain benefits to authority mm. or governments, right? And I believe fundamentally people are at least prone to be influenced in that way. It's not just money, it's all kinds of different things. And every so often you have circumstances where those potential influences can be suppressed. But when you look at really long term, I mean, you mentioned yourself, Africa isn't that far yet. If somebody were to say, well, are they just not ready yet or something like that? I would, my answer is all my life, the Western world, I come originally from Germany, have lived half my life in the United States. That Western world, when addressing issues in Africa, has always addressed it by sending money, which mm -hmm. if, you, if we're honest with ourselves, would have to admit the money has gone into corrupt hands and disappeared. And yesterday I spoke to somebody who said, well, it disappeared into a Swiss bank account, right? But that doesn't help the country, right? So if on the whole continental scale or even on a much smaller scale, somebody comes along and says, I want to spend money to really build something, make something, develop something. I think everybody in humanity that we can encounter these days in the 21st century has the capacity. They need obviously education and they need a helping hand and they need the money and some of the expertise, but they can learn and they can apply themselves. It's not where you live or where you come from. It's a matter of do you have the support that you need. India could do this. Africa could do this. We just basically kept them where they are by just sending money into corrupt hands for all my life, for, you know, like decades after decades after decades. So that's why I'm a little skeptical if you look to 2100 and beyond. Will those who are intrigued by, well, if you keep this group in here and this group in here and that group in here, Right. Is that beneficial enough to do it? Or is it, no, we're all in this together. We want to make India the next superpower. Yeah. Absolutely. I hear you. You know, the people, you know, certain parties who have power, retain power by keeping folks divided, right, in this right. way. That's a certain, <laughs> you know, unfortunate uh, situation. At the same time, I, I, you know, I guess I'm an optimist, right? I'm an optimist right, in that. Yeah, yeah. Day. Well, that's why we yeah. both want to go and see in the future. <laughs> What we'll find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I think we talked a much broader spectrum than, than I thought, and you may this have expected. Uh, but before we end, tell people that are listening to us, how can they get a hold of you if they find themselves to be well-earning uh, individuals who want to basically have a passive way of investing their money? Absolutely. Come check us out at bloominvest.com. And otherwise, shoot me an email, nikhil at bloominvest.com. We'd love to get in touch with you, learn a little bit more about you. And if there's a fit, we can get you lined up as one of our initial investors. And yeah, super excited to. And of course, Axel is also doing this. I got some of the hints from the website. I was not 100% sure. 
But I mean, uh, I mean our, uh, to be honest, Nikki, we connect our tribal members, anybody who wants to join or is already with us, with people like you. We're not doing it ourselves. We love to work with people like you. That's why I brought you on as a guest. So I hope that will be a long-term relationship. Absolutely. And we'll chat more about Build to Rent. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so all these links and email and stuff like that will be found in the show notes. So thank you, Nikki, for being on the show. And I hope in some point in time in the future, we can do it again. Absolutely. Thank you, Axel. All right. Thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes, or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.